after such a great introduction, I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. <laughs> First of all, let me say that I have the privilege of being able to interact with some of the world's top scientists. Every time I talk to them, I ask them the key question. I ask them the most important question of all, and that is, is there intelligent life on the Earth? <laughs> well, I was watching the Kardashians on TV last night, and I've come to the conclusion, no, no way. No intelligent life on this planet, except here. Except here, there's a of intelligent, thoughtful people, because you people are thirsty for knowledge about the world around us. Now, I'm a physicist, and some of you may think that, well, you physicists are know-it-alls. But let me tell you a, a short story. Over 200 years ago, we had the great French Revolution. And one day, there were three gentlemen about to have their heads chopped off at the guillotine. A priest, a lawyer, and a theoretical physicist, just like me, <laughs> on a chopping block. Well, they put the priest's head on the chopping block. And they asked him, do you have any last words? And he said, yes, yes. He said, God, God from above shall set me free. Well, we'll see about that. All eyes are on the blade. They raised the blade. The blade came down, swish, and stopped right before it hit the neck of the priest. <gasps> People gasped. How can that be? Let him go, said the masses. God has spoken today. And now let's see about the lawyer. Well, they put the lawyer's head in the chopping block, and they asked him, do you have any last words? And he said, yes. Maybe the spirit of justice, justice and mercy shall set me free. Well, they raised the blade. The blade came down, swish, and stopped right before he hit the neck of the lawyer. This time the crowd went crazy. National holiday should be declared, they said. Today, God has spoken. Justice and mercy have spoken. And now, let's see about that physicist. <laughs> well, they put the physicist's head on the chopping block, and they asked him, do you have any last words? And he said, yeah, yeah, I got some last words. And he said, you know, I don't know too much about God. I know even less about the law. But I do know one thing. If you look up, you'll see that the rope is stuck on the pulley. <laughs> and then the physicist said, if you remove the rope, the blade should come down real good. Big mistake. Huge, big mistake. Well, the blade came down and the physicist's head came down. The moral of the story is, sometimes we physicists have to know when to keep our mouths shut. <laughs> Especially when you are ahead. And to understand the future, you have to sort of know what's happening elsewhere. This is Future of the Mind, where I talk about one day we'll have... But let's go back in time now. If we had a time machine, let's go back 2,000 years. It turns out that in 1901, off the coast in Greece, there was a shipwreck. They dated the shipwreck to 2,000 years ago. And in the shipwreck, they found a piece of garbage on the left. But that garbage didn't look like an ordinary piece of garbage. They brushed away the corals, the dirt, and they realized, oh my God, it's a computer. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the world's oldest computer found in the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, probably a gift for Julius Caesar for his coronation. So we're talking about a piece of history. Who did this? Who created a computer 2,000 years ago? Look at this. This locates the position of the planets. It's a planetarium. Calculating the motion of the moon, the eclipses, Mercury, Venus, Saturn, up to, up to Jupiter and Saturn. Who could have done this? We don't know. But this is the power of the human mind, that we can make an analog computer, as it's called, an analog computer that would not be rivaled for the next 2,000 years. Because over the next 2,000 years, we began to dabble what are called analog computers. We turn the crank. We slide the rule. We move the beads up and down. 
This is what we did for the next 2,000 years, when 2,000 years ago, we already had advanced computers. But anyway, now it's the late 1800s. England is rising up as an industrial power and has to calculate finances, interest rates, mortgage payments. You have to understand where the fleet is. You have to draw accurate maps of the earth. All of that requires computation. So we have here Charles Gat Babbage, the father of the analog computer. He's the one who said we need a machine that can calculate numbers. He was a member of the Royal Astronomical Society. He would plot the motion of the planets, calculate interest rates, calculate banking records. And he, he was working with a woman, Lady Lovelace, who became the world's first programmer, programming the computer built by Charles Babbage. These two individuals set into motion the computer revolution. And as I said before, these people found the instrument that was previously worked out 2,000 years ago in Greece that he could not build. He ran out of money. But later, using his designs, we finished the machine. Look at this machine. This was the most powerful machine of its type, an analog computer. But time marches on. Now we have the beginning of World War II. World War II, the Germans, the Nazis, create this machine called the Enigma. And they're able to communicate with the far-flung Nazi Empire and all their, their armed forces. This is the device that allowed Hitler to talk to all his troops around the world. Well, the Allies captured some, and they gave it to the mathematicians in London. And the, and the verdict was, find out how this works, and then jam it. Well, it was rested upon this mathematical genius on the right called Alan Turing. He was one of the directors of the project to decode the secret Nazi war plans. Fortunately, they were successful, and as a consequence, they probably shortened World War II by two years. And on for two more years, except for the fact that Alan Turing, shown on the right, was able to build a machine that could break the code. Here on the left, we have a Hollywood movie, uh, The Imitation Game, based on the work of Alan Turing. Alan Turing on the right codified the laws of computation. For 2,000 years, it was by hand, figuring out what gears, levers, pulleys are required to make a computation. He systematized it. He introduced the concept that there is an input of zeros and ones, zeros and ones, zeros and ones, binary, and there's a processor that allows you to process that information, and he wrote down the rules for that. On the left is a Turing machine. Where do you find Turing machines? In your pocket. Your cell phone is a Turing machine. All the machines that drive the industrial rev the computer revolution are Turing machines based on the simple idea, zeros and ones, zeros and ones, processed by a processor on an infinite page. Hey. Aspect of the story. It turns out that one day, well, Alan Turing helped to win World War II. He saved the lives of perhaps several hundred thousand people shortened World War II by two years, but after the war, nobody knew his name. He was top secret. Nobody knew his name for years. And then one day, the police came. Somebody burglarized his house. They, the police looked at the house, and they found that he was gay. For that, he was arrested. This was a national hero. The man who helped to win World War II era is coming to a close. This is Moore's Law. This is the law on which the industrialized nations base all their industrial projections. This law here shows that computer power doubles every 18 months. And it's a perfect logarithmic curve. Every 18 months, computers are twice as powerful as the previous Christmas, except now, Moore's Law is slowing down. Moore's Law will collapse. 
And it means that at Christmas time, our toys will not be as powerful as the previous Christmas. They'll be flat. So then the next question is, will Silicon Valley become a rust belt? Well, people have thought about this problem. Sooner or later, a transistor becomes so small, it is maybe five atoms across. When a transistor is five atoms across, it leaks out the electron. By the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you get leakage and the whole thing collapses. Well, this man here, Nobel laureate Richard Feynman, one of the people who built the atomic bomb, in fact, realized that we have to go to stage three. First stage was analog computers. Second stage was uh, digital computers. The third stage is atomic computers. Up, let's say, and spin down. Therefore, this is a simple way to represent zero and one. Okay, you got that? This is zero, or an atom, and this is one. Our economy is based on that principle. The world economy is based on the idea that you know, I can have a zero and a one. Now, apply the quantum mechanics to this thing. Now this arrow can point in any direction whatsoever. Any direction, simultaneously. How many more states are there on which you can compute? If there's two states, up and down, for a digital computer in your pocket, then how many states are there if the axis can rotate in any direction? The answer is infinite. Let me repeat, these computers are infinitely more powerful than what's in your pocket, a digital computer. These are quantum computers. Now what can you do with it? Let's say I have a maze, and I shoot a mouse through a maze, and I let the computer calculate the probability that the mouse will go through the maze. How do you do that? Well, each time the, ma each time the mouse hits a dead end, it calculates that. It calculates this bump, calculates that, and it successfully calculates every single possible path. How long does it take? You have to calculate thousands of different paths. How many paths are there? Thousands of paths from the upper left to the lower right. That's your computer. That's how your computer solves a mouse in a maze. Now, let's do a quantum computer. If you put the quantum computer, the quantum computer calculates every single path simultaneously. Let me repeat that again. If you get this, you get the essence of what's going to revolutionize the world economy. The path from the upper left to the lower right, quantum computers analyze all possible paths simultaneously. In fact, they communicate with each other faster than the speed of light. So this is called entanglement. So this is the reason why computers based on atoms are so powerful. They compute simultaneously on many states. Plus, they talk to each other. This is the future. The world economy is going to depend on these two facets. Superposition and entanglement. So we have a race. Who are in the race? The Chinese, IBM, Microsoft. They're in a race to perfect this computer. This is what it looks like. This is a quantum computer of the first type. This computer here, the actual computer is, is about this big. The computation is actually done in a small wafer about this big. This whole apparatus is for cooling. You have to cool it down near absolute zero because the slightest burp, the slightest noise will upset the whole calculation. So how do you eliminate noise? By cooling it down to near absolute zero. Atoms come to a near halt at that point. This is what a quantum computer looks like. Not very pretty, but these computers in principle can solve problems millions of times faster than an ordinary computer. This is what it looks like. And the Chinese are in the race. They have their horse on a different uh, technology. 
Instead of electrons, they compute on light beams. Light beams is how the Chinese do it. And this is their quantum computer. Two years ago, the scientists in China and IBM, I mean Google, announced that their quantum computer can beat a supercomputer by a factor of several million times. This made world history. This is called quantum supremacy. But look at that thing. That thing is not the easiest thing to carry around. You can't carry it in your pocket. So how are we going to interact with these quantum computers? And what can they do? These quantum computers will be put in the cloud. They'll be put in the cloud, and we'll communicate with them using digital interfaces. For example, your wristwatch and your contact lens. These are internet contact lenses so that when you blink, you can communicate with a quantum computer and access the knowledge of the entire world. And who are the first people to buy internet contact lenses? College students studying for final examinations. <laughs> now this could be very handy because it also recognizes people's faces. They're good enough so that it locks onto a face, recognizes who it is. For example, you're on a blind date, and your blind date says that he's rich, he's unattached, he's single, but your contact lens says that, no, he's a loser. He's a, the guy is three times divorced, child support payments. Nope, that's not what we see in the contact lens. And let's say at night, you're at a cocktail party, and there's some very important people at that cocktail party, they can offer you a job. But you don't know who they are. In the future, you'll know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party. Model zeros and ones, zeros and ones, zeros and ones. Molecules are not zeros and ones. Mother Nature speaks the language of electrons, speaks the language of molecules, not zeros and ones. And so, photosynthesis sunlight comes in, interacts with carbon dioxide, makes sugar, and releases oxygen. This is a process that a quantum computer will be able to create an artificial leaf. That's a project now, an artificial leaf, and also artificial fertilizer from a quantum computer. Plus, already, the aerospace industry is using quantum computers to model airflow on an airplane. Remember the Concorde? The Concorde exploded, it was canceled, it was supersonic. Why did the Concorde not meet expectations? because of the sonic boom. Nobody wanted a sonic boom going over their house, shattering windows. Nobody wanted that. So the Concorde could not fly over the United States. That was a tremendous loss. Why? Because they were using 1960 technology. 1960. That's the dinosaur era. But that's all they had back then in 1960. Now we have quantum computers that can compute airflow to create supersonic transports without a sonic boom. can revolutionize the space program. And also the automobile manufacturers, Mercedes-Benz, is using quantum computers to again reduce airflow and drag on their, on their cars. And why aren't we in the solar age? We've been talking about the solar age for decades. Ever since we were kids, we were told that solar power would be the age of the future. Nope, never happened. Why? Because the weak link, everybody forgets, is the battery. Everybody thinks the battery obeys Moore's law, that it doubles in power every 18 months. Nope, batteries are clunky devices that are based on chemistry, not Moore's law. That's where supercomputers come in. We're talking about virtual chemistry. Think about that doing chemical reactions in the memory of a computer without chemicals. Think about that. This is going to revolutionize chemistry. <laughs> Think about that. When the industry, medical industry, wants to create a new medicine, what do they do? They get thousands of petri dishes like this, seed it with different kinds of poisons and different kinds of chemicals, and just cross their fingers. This is how the next super wonder drug is made. 
trial and error over thousands of chemicals. So how much does it cost? Billions. It costs billions of dollars for a pharmaceutical company to market a super drug. That's how complicated this is. Why? It's all trial and error. Why? Because computers only model zeros and ones, zeros and ones, but it's molecules that make disease work. In the future, we are going to do medicine in the memory of a computer. Now some people say, will this put chemists out of work? Are chemists going to be unemployed? No. Chemists who do not use quantum computers will be fired. <laughs> of the brain cause Alzheimer's disease. You do an autopsy, the brain is all gummed up. But you see, it is a mystery. Some people die of Alzheimer's and their mind is clear, totally clear, but they have amyloid proteins everywhere. So it's not one to one. If you have amyloid protein, it does not mean that you're gonna get Alzheimer's. This means there are probably at least two amyloid proteins that gum up the brain. One that actually does gum up the brain and the other one doesn't. And they found this just last year. Just last year, they realized that we've been barking up the wrong tree. It's not the amyloid protein that comes up the brain. There are two types of amyloid protein. One spins to the right, and one spins to the left. They're images of each other. And how do we tell them apart? Quantum computers. So quantum computers may give us a handle on Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, because we're talking molecules now a whole era that was forbidden to us because our computers are digital computers that compute on zeros and ones, zeros and ones. Institution plan. Last year was announced in California that they hit break even. The amount of energy putting in equals the amount of energy putting out. What's the problem? Why didn't we have fusion power earlier? It's because the gas, the gas that circulates inside here is unstable. It's only stable for a few seconds, and then it destabilizes. Why? Because of the magnetic field, because of the geometry, we have instability. How do you cure that? Quantum computers. Quantum computers can allow you to calculate the instability, and then use magnetic fields to rectify it. So this could give us energy from the sun. You know that Mother Nature does not burn gasoline, Mother Nature does not use uranium. So what lights up the sky? Fusion. Fusion is nature's way of lighting up the universe. And the key to that could be quantum computers. And the origin of the universe may be revealed by a quantum computer. This is the Large Hadron Collider. It is the biggest atom smasher on Earth. The city of Geneva can be placed inside the machine. That's how big this machine is. It slams protons together to recreate a mini Big Bang. But the calculation is so complicated that we're using quantum computers to analyze the data now. Just last year it was announced. This the data from creation itself is being analyzed by a quantum computer. Read that again. Up to now, how did you know you had cancer? Well, you had a tumor. What happens? You go to the hospital immediately. Well, now with a simple blood test, we can detect 50 different cancers in your blood. What does this mean? This means the word tumor will eventually disappear from the English language. We will no longer say the word tumor anymore. And how are we going to analyze this? Well, of course, in the laboratory, but in the future, probably your toilet. You go to the bathroom, the bathroom will analyze your bodily fluids and tell you, you have cancer. Do something. You have 10 years to do something. Think about it. This could be the cure for cancer at the preventive level. Not necessarily the molecular level yet, but at the preventive level, this could be the cure for cancer. It's very much worried about this technology. Why? Because Quantum computers are so powerful, they can break any government digital code. We're not there yet, but in principle, every top secret code can be broken by a quantum computer. What do we do? 
prevent this is with another quantum computer. So we could have a war between different quantum computers. But the CIA is very much aware of this. Papers that have been leaked unintentionally from the CIA clearly show that they're monitoring progress with quantum computers. What makes them so powerful? And the answer is, they calculate in parallel universes. Parallel universes. Let's say I have a beam of particles shot through two, two slits. Normally you would expect them to make two blips on the screen, but no, they make an interference pattern. Because the electron is a wave, behaves like a wave, you got that? But now, let's close off one of those slits. Let's shut down one of those slits here. So there's only one opening. What do we have? The same thing. The same interference pattern. But that's impossible. How can an electron interfere with itself? But that's what happens. The electron interferes with itself. Why is that? Because it is two places at the same time. Now, ever since you were a child, you've been told that you cannot be two places at the same time. That's wrong. Everything you know about common sense is wrong. You can, in fact, be two places at the same time if you are an electron. In fact, you exist in multiple universes. That's the power of quantum computers. And then people ask me the next question. Is Elvis Presley still alive in a parallel universe? And the answer is yes, he's probably still alive in a parallel universe. This goes back to the shortage of cat problem, that a cat in a box can be either dead or alive simultaneously. This is freaky. Think about it. Your loved ones, people that have died in your universe, could be alive in another parallel universe. Get used to it. <laughs> this is called quantum mechanics, and this is the reason why they're so powerful. Let's say that the world is a motion picture. We think that the world can be put on one frame of a motion picture. But now we realize that with quantum mechanics, it can split. Split into a multiverse of universes. This means that our universe may not be the only one. This means that we may be living in an ocean of different universes. And this gets us to the string theory, which is the basis of my previous book, The God Equation. We're not going to discuss that today. So it means that Alice could have been right. That Alice went through the looking glass into a parallel universe. This is the power of quantum computers. They compute on more than one universe. There are wormholes that connect them to different universes. So I'll talk more about this in the Q&A session. And of course, Hollywood has discovered this now. The biggest Hollywood movies are all set in the multiverse. And where does the multiverse come from? It comes from physics. This Hollywood is following the lead of physicists now. They're consulting with physicists, and that's why all the great movies of Hollywood now are set in the multiverse. Now, uh, your jobs are on the line, so they're the ones hysterically yelling, oh my god, the, ch the chatbots are coming, the chatbots are coming. But realize that just because their jobs are being affected, doesn't mean that the society as a whole is being affected. So chatbots are a software development. Quantum computers are a hardware development. And what is a chatbot? Think of a tape recorder. A tape recorder that has hundreds of different kinds of interviews, interviews with people. A chatbot then takes snippets of each interview, splices them together, and passes it off as the output. So in other words, chatbots are not original. They cannot create anything new, no new theory, no new novel. They simply take existing uh, articles, existing speeches, splice them together into one thing. Therefore, they're not a danger. They're not gonna take over the world. They're not sentient. They're not like the Terminator. But you've seen interviews where there are robots that say that, yes, we're gonna take over the world. How's that possible? 
You see, some teenage boy <laughs> writes an essay about how to take over the world. The chatbot doesn't understand right from wrong, good, bad, left, right, doesn't understand any of that. It just takes chunks of different essays. So it takes the essay from the teenage boy that says we're going to take over the world, and all of a sudden, big headlines. Computer says we're going to take over the world. Remember, they're tape recorders. They're not original. They don't understand right from wrong, propaganda from the truth. They don't understand any of that. They're just tape recorders. But again, the journalists who write about that don't understand that. And they make it sound as if the robots are going to take over the world. Nope, doesn't work that way. Nuclear. Okay? So we're talking about nuclear computers. But that's a whole nother ball of wax. Okay. Right, yeah. But you know, atoms we're familiar with. You can mold things, create things out of atoms. You put them in a magnetic field and they compute. Okay, that's how we make quantum computers, in fact. So now we're talking about pushing that realm, atomic computers, quantum computers, as far as they can go. And that's important because Mother Nature is basically a huge quantum computer. Mother Nature with photosynthesis in digestion, cancer, everything that deals with, with organic materials is all governed by Mother Nature. And how does she do it? Molecular quantum mechanics. That's how Mother Nature does it. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to model cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, all the diseases that are way beyond the capabilities of digital computers. We'll model them with quantum computers. Think about that. This could be the solution eventually to cancer and Alzheimer's disease. 